All right, this video is going to tell you about the differences between men and women as far as their exercise physiology. We're also going to talk about some issues that are very specific to women only. When we're talking about anything biological or physiological, generally speaking, the correct terminology is sex, not gender. Gender is a social and cultural construct um, where sex is a biological construct. So something that um, we have really no um, say over. It's something that's determined uh, by our genetics primarily and something that is determined at our birth. It's not something that we can learn or change or adapt over time. For a very long time, it was uh, uh, frowned upon for females to uh, participate in sports. So women were often told it was dangerous or unladylike or for some reason they shouldn't be participating in sports, they shouldn't be exercising. Um, and we now obviously know that not to be true. But for a very long time that was the norm, that was what we as a society thought and spoke about. And um, it still exists um, in some places in the world today and it still impacts us here even in the United States today. So. Over the last 30 to 40 years, women have become more and more involved with sports, more and more involved in um, exercise. Um, and so some of this has gone away, but again, it hasn't gone away in its entirety. Um, and so because of this, and also some biological uh, uh, differences between men and women, um, it's important for us to talk about the things we're going to talk about in this, uh, this video. The reason why there's a difference between men and women when it comes to physical capacity to do things, um, besides the cultural reasons that we already discussed, is the differences in the primary sex hormones. Men have a lot of testosterone and not so much estrogen and progesterone, where women on the other, other hand have lots of estrogen and progesterone but very little testosterone. So testosterone is associated with bone formation and larger bones as well as protein synthesis, which means larger muscles, um, and increases in EPO, urethropoietin uh, secretion, which is the hormone that's going to cause red blood cells to be formed and released by the bone marrow. So this means they're going to have more red blood cells floating around as well. So women, on the other hand, uh, their sex hormones are going to increase fat deposition. So in other words, the, the creation of fat. So if we look at this graph here, we can see that across stages of puberty, um, both sexes increase their sex-specific hormones. Again, the, the hormone that is increased just happens to be different between men and women, and that's what causes a lot of the effects that we're going to be talking about in this video. So when comparing men and women when it comes to muscular strength, uh, men tend to be stronger than women. Um, but the difference is more extreme when we look at the upper body than if we look at the lower body. Untrained women tend to be more untrained than untrained men. And so the, essentially the, the major reasoning behind the differences between upper and lower body is that uh, women walk around every day just like men walk around every day. So their lower bodies tend to have pretty close to the same level of training where their upper bodies women tend to do less physically active things, at least uh, untrained sedentary women, than what their uh, male counterparts do. And so the upper body women are typically 40 to 60 percent weaker than males because they simply use the tissues less. Um, where in the lower body there's a 25 to 30 percent difference between men and women, so it's a much smaller difference. Again, uh, this is because uh, the lower body is trained about equally between uh, sedentary men and sedentary women. Regardless of how much the discrepancy is between uh, a certain group of untrained men and a certain group of untrained women, the reason why there's a difference in strength is because men tend to have bigger muscles. It's not something to do with the way the muscles function or the way the uh, nervous system functions. It's simply because men have larger muscles brought on by the higher testosterone levels. So if you were to look at uh, men and women all in the same graph and look at their cross-sectional area of their muscle and the strength that is produced by that muscle, they would be equally as strong. So we have the width of the biceps when it's flexed on the x-axis. So if we measured, we took your bicep, you, caused, you flexed it, and then we just measured that width there and the biceps 1RM strength, so how much force you can produce with a biceps curl. 
Um, so you can see a pretty clear linear relationship here. Linear meaning a straight line where the greater the flex bicep width, so the thicker that muscle, the more force it can produce. And this is regardless of if you're a man or a woman, you're gonna produce more force with a bigger muscle. It just, the again, the difference between men and women when it comes to strength is not anything related to um, molecular structure of the muscle. It's simply having more muscle mass. Besides just muscular strength, there can be a difference between men and women when it comes to bone density as well. And this is something that's really important for women's uh, health because women tend to be more uh, likely to develop osteoporosis later in life, especially after they have passed menopause. Um, and so weight-bearing exercise in young women is especially important because that weight-bearing exercise, along with the proper nutrition, is what's going to allow them to increase their bone density. When comparing men and women as far as their cardiorespiratory system's ability to be trained, so in other words, we take two people who are equal abilities, both a one is a man, one is a woman, and we put them through an exercise routine, they're gonna both get equally as uh, much improvement out of that. So the training effects for the cardiovascular system are about the same between men and women. So despite the fact that the training effects are about the same between men and women, men tend to have more capable cardiorespiratory systems than women do. And the reason for this is primarily to do with body size. So uh, men have larger chest cavities, which means they're gonna have larger lungs. So they can take in more air per breath than what most women can. Likewise, uh, men are gonna have larger hearts than women. And so a larger heart means more blood can get into it, which means with one pump, you can pump more blood out of it. And so if we look at this, uh, this graph here, we have stroke volume, which is how much blood comes out with one beat of the heart. It's higher in men than it is in women. Again, because of the differences in heart size. Um, because of this, if we are looking at a, a set submaximal exercise intensity, so here the example is 50 watts of exercise, oh, 50 watts of intensity on a bicycle ergometer, so on an exercise bike, the men are going to have slightly higher stroke volume than women because of that larger heart, which means they can have higher, slightly lower heart rate than women do because they don't need to beat their heart as many times to get the same amount of blood out of it because between the two, because it's a matched exercise intensity, they need about the same cardiac output. So again, same cardiac output, men get to it with an increase in stroke volume, women, well, more of an increase in stroke volume, women get to it with more of an increase in heart rate. Both increase heart rate and stroke volume, but again, it's more dramatic for the men in stroke volume, more dramatic for the women in heart rate. So if you're doing the same submaximal exercise intensity uh, between a, a man and a woman, uh, and they're fairly well matched uh, for their training level, they're going to have about the same uh, VO2 level when you're expressed in relative units. So about the same VO2 level, but how they get to that VO2 level is a little bit different. Men have more hemoglobin because they have more uh, urethroperitin being excreted into their system, uh, producing more red blood cells. So they're going to uh, have more oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Women are going to simply extract more um, oxygen out of their blood, so they're going to have a greater AVO2 difference than what men do at a submaximal exercise intensity. Um, so this is a compensatory mechanism that women are using in order to reach the same level of exercise intensity that the male, their male counterpart is. Um, so that's submaximal exercise. If you look at maximal exercise, relative VO2 between men and women are going to be different. Men are going to have a higher relative VO2 than what women do. Again, relative VO2, meaning how much oxygen in milliliters is being consumed by one kilogram of body mass per minute. So the reason for this is that uh, one of the things that we already mentioned already is that uh, hemoglobin is lower in women than it is in men. So the, at peak exercise, they're going to be um, they're going to have a lower peak that they can get oxygen around the body with. So. Uh, in a unit of blood circulating the body, there's less oxygen. So that's going to work uh, a little bit to the disadvantage of women. They're also going to have a lower stroke volume max, um, causing a lower cardiac output max because they have that smaller heart that we already mentioned as well. So this is sort of low uh, impact on VO2. This is more moderate impact on VO2. The real reason why there's a large difference for relative VO2 between men and women is the fact that 
women have the greater body fat percentage. So when we're expressing um, VO2 in relative terms to total body mass, we're not taking in consideration the fact that women have more fats, so more of that total body mass is sort of inactive tissue than what it is for men. So if we were to express VO2 in, per unit of muscle mass, we would have a little bit uh, closer uh, numbers between men and women for this. So the primary reason why looking at a relative VO2 in uh, per kilogram of body mass, total body mass, is the fact that women just have more inactive tissue than men do. So talking specifically about women here, um, women have uh, a menstrual cycle, it's a 28 day cycle, that's what's being displayed here in this, uh, this graph. Um, so at the beginning of their cycle they have their menstrual, uh, their menses, so they have their period, and then they ovulate about halfway through, and at the end of the 28 days it restarts at the beginning. And this is all controlled by different sex hormones as displayed here. And so um, it's important for women to maintain a normal menstrual cycle. Eumenorrhea is the term given when there's a normal 28-day menstrual cycle. Oligomenorrhea is uh, irregular menstruation. So in other words, they get their menstrual their menstruation, but it happens irregular uh, month to month. So one month can be 28 days, and the next month might be 35 days, and then 20 days, and it's kind of all over the place. Then there is amenorrhea, which is when they are lacking a menstruation at completely. So they go several months without menstruating. So estimates vary between about 5% and 66% of female athletes who have some level of irregularity to their menstrual cycle. And the reason why there's such a wide range, that 5 to 66%, is because um, different um, researchers out there who are looking into this have different definitions of what is considered irregular. Somebody with a very liberal definition is going to be higher on this spectrum. Somebody with a more strict definition might be closer to that 5%. So the reason why uh, we care about menstruation cycles and making sure that they stay regular and they don't become um, irregular or become completely amenorrheic is because it affects bone density. And so bone density later in life is going to be impacted by the things that young female athletes are doing right now. So um, it's important to have physical activity in order to maintain bone health but it is also important to maintain proper caloric intake so that you can maintain that menstrual cycle which is essentially like a constant check on whether or not you're getting proper caloric intake. So what we can see here with this graph is women who always have a regular period have the highest bone density. People, uh, Women with um, sometimes irregular periods are in the middle and then the ones who are always are irregular are either amenorrheic or just, or just very sporadic with their cycle have the lowest bone mineral density. And so you can see this clear relationship between maintaining a proper menstruation cycle and also having good bone density. In some situations, having uh, losing that menstruation cycle might not be something that happened just by accident. It can be something that um, is caused by a, a disorder like anorexia or bulimia where the, the athlete or the individual you're, you're working with is specifically not taking in as much calories as they need to because they have some sort of body dysmorphia where they're afraid of fatness and they don't want to uh, increase their body mass or increase their fat mass. And that is something that is of extra concern and if you feel that you're working with somebody or that you yourself are um, in this category where you have some sort of eating disorder, it's outside the scope of a, an exercise physiologist or an exercise scientist or for that matter a, a phys ed teacher or anybody else like that to treat this. This is really a psychological disorder and it's your, uh, it's your goal to catch them, uh, catch these athletes who might be doing this or experiencing this but not necessarily treat them. You want to get them treatment. It's outside of our scope of practice. So talking a little more about anorexia and bulimia. So anorexia is when you essentially starve yourself. You don't bring in as much energy as you should. Um, where bulimia is usually some sort of binging and purging type situation where you're eating a lot of uh, food and then uh, getting rid of it through either vomiting, taking laxatives, or excessive exercise to try to balance out the calorie intake. So either one of these, anorexia or bulimia, is an eating disorder that's very, very serious. It's most common with women, which is why we're talking about in this section. 
It can happen with men too, especially in those sports where weight classes are involved or lean physiques are involved, but it's very, very prevalent within young females, especially young female athletes. So when a, a, a young female athlete is not getting enough uh, nutrition in, or not enough calories in, and they're exercising a lot, and they lose their menstrual, menstrual cycle, they often fall into this category called fem, female athlete triad, meaning there's an energy deficit, they have amenorrhea, and what's harder to detect, they also often have low bone density or are becoming um, closer to having low bone density the longer they have this situation. So this is this constant cycle where the three sort of feed off of each other and it's really bad for the, the female long term for their health, especially that bone mineral density. So this is something that needs to be addressed immediately and the way of treating it um, besides if there is a psychological disorder getting them some sort of help but if it's just something that was done by poor planning the way to treat it is by incre increasing caloric intake and sometimes decreasing physical activity so another um, situation that's very specific to women is exercise while pregnant um, so it's now thought that it is good and healthy for most women to exercise when they're pregnant um, there are several guidelines out there um, that can help to uh, tell you a little bit about what you should do and should not do. I'm going to hit a few of the big ones here, but not all of them. Um, so you should start mild to moderate exercise. You should not just jump into high intensity exercise. Generally speaking, whatever you're doing before you got pregnant, you can continue doing when you're pregnant as long as your pregnancy um, doesn't have any uh, complications. And keep in mind, I'm not a medical uh, professional. This is just sort of general guidelines that are given out by the medical community. You should talk to your doctor if you're pregnant or somebody you're working with who if is pregnant, they should talk to their doctor about this. But generally speaking, these are the recommendations. So avoid high intensity exercise unless you were doing it before you were pregnant. Avoid any exercise where you're supine or prone, so on your back or on your stomach after that first trimester where the sort of baby bump starts to develop. Avoid exercising to extreme fatigue or avoid exercising at high altitudes or during very hot or very cold weather. So maybe bring the exercise indoor in those conditions. Um, also, you should avoid anything where there's uh, changes in pressure, like uh, scuba diving, for instance. Um, that sort of thing can affect how oxygen is getting into your blood and potentially affect um, things with your unborn child. And uh, generally speaking, avoid anything where there's any risk of uh, trauma, some sort of hit to the stomach. So uh, avoid like bicycling where you might accidentally fall or any sort of balance um, activity because your balance is going to be different than what it was before you were pregnant because your body is now changing its shape. So I'll put a link in the description below to uh, a website that'll give you a lot more specific recommendations. Uh, but generally speaking, it's very difficult to do research on um, pregnancy or on uh, pregnant women because uh, of the potential conflicts of interest or the ethical uh, consequences of work of doing uh, experimental work on a person who has a, a, a small person inside of them. So we don't know all the time what's gonna happen when we do something. And so uh, a lot of this, uh, while there's been a lot more research in recent years, there's still a lot more research to go. And so we have very um, cautious guidelines at this point in time, but some women do very high intensity exercise. Some women do marathons while pregnant. Um, so it's possible to exercise at high levels while pregnant but you should do so only with the uh, advice of your, your doctor that you're working with with your pregnancy. All right, so I hope that helps. Uh, there's a very brief overview of the differences between men and women um, and their exercise capacity and reasons for those differences, as well as some uh, female-specific health considerations that should be taken in, into consideration um, when working with a female athlete.